That was Notebook LM doing our podcast intro. Much better than I can ever. Sasha, what do you think? It's pretty amazing. I love it. So today we're diving into Google's new AI tool. It's called Notebook LM. And get this, it turns any document, like meeting notes, research, anything, into a full-on audio conversation. Like a podcast. Okay, let's dive in. So as you can see, uh, we kicked off this episode with Notebook LM, which is Google's new notebook podcast tech. It's voice-enabled conversations between two AI. And then later on, we're going to actually cover Dario Amadei, the CEO of Anthropic. He wrote this amazing essay. We're going to cover that. And then we'll end with Liquid Foundation Model, which is new tech that is coming down the pipe. So Sasha, Notebook LM, this thing came out, what, a few months ago, but July, but now it's sort of like... Because when I showed it to you like a month ago, you're like, oh, yeah, that, that was like so last season. But now like the, the Wall Street Journal, here's the article that it wrote, uh, Google Notebook LM podcast deep dive audio. It's a new podcast between two AI talking to each other and having this sort of it's not like Eleven Labs, just sort of like voiceover AI, her open AI talking to it. it's crazily conversational. Yeah, I mean, it really does feel like you're listening to a podcast. You can turn any content into something that you can listen to in the car and it sounds like an organic conversation with the insights synthesized and all those sorts of things. It's pretty impressive. Yeah. So what I did was I actually, okay, I took last uh, podcast that we, the last episode, and I took the transcript from YouTube, cleaned it up using AI, and then I fed it back into Notebook LM. It's going to redo the announcement of OpenAI's $6.6 billion race. And I'm going to play it for you. And I want you to give me your thoughts on it because you haven't heard it yet. So Not this is your first yet. time hearing it. Okay, here we go. Okay, ready? Yeah. 6.6 billion dollars yeah that's uh quite a bit of money that's what open ai just raised in their latest funding round it's it's huge it's massive but you know what's even more interesting than the dollar amount what's that what they're planning to do with it yeah what are they doing with it well lucky for us sam altman actually shared some insights at a recent developer event so today we're doing a deep dive on open ai sounds good let's dive in because get this altman's emphasizing research for the next two years research hmm. which is great and all but with $6.6 .6 billion, you'd think they'd be rolling out every flashy new AI tool under the sun, right? <laughs> you'd think so. There's so much potential for you know new products and apps and all that. Right. So what's the deal? Well, it sounds like OpenAI is playing the long game here, right? Okay. They're thinking bigger than just the next cool AI gadget. They're aiming for something much more ambitious. Which is? AGI. Artificial General Intelligence. Okay, so hold on. Back up for a sec. We've talked about AGI before. But for those tuning in for the first time, what does that actually mean? Okay, okay. Let's pause here. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I mean, this is last week. This is this is last week's episode. This changes the game for some people, but for some people, I think like they bring in the personality, the this, the theatrics. Um, so my first impression is this is going to make reading research papers a lot easier, like because they are very very dry, and some you're probably looking up every second or third word sometimes. And if they are breaking that down for you, this allows you to consume the content while you're while you're driving, and, and you don't have to be in front of a computer to consume the content anymore, which is game changing, like because that opens up an extra two or three hours potentially a week where you can consume the content and, and, and get through it. So super impressive. It, it'd be very easy to dismiss this as like, ah, oh, you know, what's the big deal? Like we've automated podcasts. But from my perspective, that's two to three hours a week that I've just clawed back in, in productivity. So honestly, pretty impressive. And it, it, they missed some of the, the the parts where they should be adding emphasis and they kind of focused on one part instead of the other. But I mean, I'm getting 95% of the content. Like it's at time, at 2x speed, you could you could bust through a lot of research papers now. So very impressive. I think what's really interesting about this, of course, the conversation, their interruptions, they're kind of like uh, ooing and eyeing about what they're saying to each other is very natural. And there's a, some there's definitely new tech here involved that we've never seen before. This isn't simply text to speech, which already exists with single yeah. individuals. This is an interaction between two two minds, and they're talking yeah. and. I think what's really interesting is, in some sense, it, it can feel gimmicky. It can feel gimmicky because yeah. it's like, well, is it reasoning? Is it doing something special that it can never been done before? It just seems like it's just two people talking. But I think the fact is they're packaging up sort of kind of now what I would consider off the shelf stuff, which is AI cleanup, creating a conversation between uh, a transcript that I, I gave it, um, mimicking what a script would be between two individuals. And then, of course, feeding that <clears throat> into this conversation AI that you can hear. But the way they're packaging it, you're saying that like, okay, you're, you're, you got two Yahoo's like us, you put their transcript, but what if you took a world-class paper and you fed it and stuff that you and I just don't understand, but these podcasters, they can break it down into a lot simpler ideas, like kind of like what you and I do, <laughs> so that the, 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 the vast audience out there can be doing that while driving to work. And I actually saw something uh, interesting over the weekend. I'm not sure if you saw this as well, and we can post a link in the comment section, uh, but there was one where they told them that they are a, like AI. 
And <laughs> have you seen that video? No, it's AI thinking they're AI. Yeah, no, so they reveal to them like that they're AI. And it's like, and he's like, the, the, the guy's like, hey, I, I, I mean, this week's episode is, is pretty amazing. Like, I mean, yeah, it's, you could say it's quite shocking and, and we're personally affected. <laughs> and it's like, all right, lay, lay it on me. What is it? It's like, well, the producer just told me just now that we're AI and everything is a simulation. Um, <laughs> It's like AI achieves self-consciousness yeah. on the podcast. And we, we should, in reverse, we should try and emulate it to sound like it. And the, the cycle will be complete. Um, I don't have a deep, buttery voice like that guy. He's got a deep, buttery voice. That's beautiful. Of, so kind of a little salacious. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So the next thing I want to talk about uh, today is uh, Dario Amade. He actually, uh, CEO of Anthropic, he actually was the VP of research over at OpenAI. And he was at Google DeepMind, I think, prior to that. But... He wrote this essay. It's, it's quite lengthy. We'll put the link uh, in the show notes. And I do encourage you to try to go through it. He goes through like these topics in biology, uh, neurobiology, uh, physical sciences, health, and basically says, this is what I see as the impact that AI will make. And, and although this might be like a futurist speaking, the fact is Dario and, and, and folks like him and Elon Musk and Bill Gates, they're at the cutting edge because they actually see around the corner that we can't. And so you kind of have to take his essay a little bit more seriously because, you know, he sees what's actually behind the curtain at the moment, right? Yeah, and I, I think uh, this is another voice in, in a growing chorus of frontier tech leaders who have a lot of information asymmetry who are saying, hey, this the, the rate of innovation here is, is going to accelerate. And this is a message that's quite difficult to hear that, hey, we might be doubling the human lifespan in the next X years or that, you know, we may end up, you know, using this to solve a whole host of problems that for the longest time, for like thousands of years, we thought were impossible. And then suddenly someone's saying, hey, in the next five to 10 years, we might crack this. Um, but, you know, it, he's not the only one saying it. And um, a lot of the research community thinks this way as well. And, and they're potentially some of the more informed people on these topics. Um, some of them can get a little bit, you know, uh, what's the word here? P doom, probability of doom. Doom and gloom? <laughs> well, no, well, the P doom is, is a slightly different concept. P doom is what you think the probability of AI going rogue and making things worse, like a Terminator 2 style scenario where everything like, you know. So um, instead, like, well, it's kind of like, there's almost like this group think where people are kind of all sipping the same cordial. And you could argue that, you know, people are like, in the same way that there was a hype cycle around crypto, um, you could argue that some of the research communities, you know, drinking a lot of their own cordial. I personally do see a lot of the, uh, capability here and the unlocks. Um, when you look at just how much day-to-day -day decisions are obstructed by, or how, how much you, if you had the best person in one field, also having all of the knowledge of all of the other fields, it's that cross-pollinization that unlocks the most uh, insights. And, and a lot of the insights are, he argues, a lot of the insights are derived from frontier leaders in their world, in the world. So if we do unlock more of these frontier knowledge leaders, then these insights will likely come out at an increasing rate, especially if you consider that you can copy and paste these systems and create a million of them. So yeah, it's going to be a spicy couple of years ahead. <laughs> I, I thought that was really interesting about the article. Dario's voice isn't like just, oh, this. we're going to double lifespan, he does say that, and like yeah. we're going to solve maybe potential uh, uh, mental illnesses and have a deeper insight into neurobiology. But he also says that AI can be used, obviously, by both democracies as well as authoritarian regimes. And he kind of says that, well, AI has a lot more power when it comes to propaganda and surveillance. So there might be more zeal to embrace it within these sort of, you know, what I call the bad guys that are out there. And what was crazy about what he was saying was that, well, the way we're going to deal with it is that the democracies need to apply AI more efficiently when it comes to military and economic advantages. Get more powerful, bigger guns, stronger, as well as more money. We use AI to that to our advantage. And then by that, we're going to be able to curb the bad guys so that they don't get ahead of us. What do you think about that? I mean, I totally agree. And I, I think this is one of those situations where the cat is out of the bag and with the research here cannot be obstructed um, in any way, shape or form. And I would say that if you ask the average person in the community, they will say that, you know, it, there's two countries that, that probably lead this space and it's Israel and China and both have fantastic surveillance. When I say fantastic, I mean, from the technological perspective, but both have incredible technological capability when it comes to mass population surveillance. So I guess the problem I have is that, you know, we're going to get much better at AI because we'll, we'll be richer and use it better in terms of our guns and things like that. And, and that's how we're going to curb it. But you're saying like our democratic AI is going to be 50% better than you authoritarian regime AI. But you know, the fact is when you both have AI, it kind of just escalates 
the entire situation. You can do more damage quicker, potentially, right? I think you do need to get to a, like, and I think this is, we spoke about this before. It's like, you need to get to this new paradigm where there's like this nuclear, um, oh my God, what's the word for this? Nic um, nuclear, uh, mutually assured destruction. Yeah, mutually assured destruction. <laughs> yeah, you have to get to something like the equivalent of mutually assured destruction. And like, it's not exactly clear what that's going to look like. And we, if you look through the history books, we, we did have some close calls. Um, so he, he ends up saying that the P-do for him is, it was pretty low, like, you know, but sub 20%. Um, I fall into that range as well. I'm, yeah, you can actually look this up on, on Wikipedia, actually. We'll, we'll put up a screenshot here so you can see the various commentators and, and who they're- Some people are at zero, some people are like 100%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dario's like, I think it says 10, 10 to 20%. I looked them up, yeah. P-do. Probability that AI will basically destroy us, yeah. <laughs> a, a, a la Terminator. Well, uh, liquid foundation models, let's just move into that. You know, this was kind of new for me. This is a MIT group, uh, basically are trying to model neural net deep learning tech based on some biological sort of pattern that they see within the brain about what they call attention. That's really cool. There's a video we can play back while you talk about it, but what, what is it for the audience and why should we care? Yeah, so it's, it's a new model architecture, which actually is a new way of I guess, storing, interpreting, and understanding information relative to transformers. And they haven't published their, they've actually published a paper on the liquid neural nets, which is what the drone uh, video is running on, but they haven't actually published the technical uh, paper yet for the, the transformer style uh, capability. So the liquid foundation models, like they've posted some results, which we'll put up on the screen as well here. The most impressive thing here is that with, with a significantly smaller memory footprint, they can output a pretty impressive context length. And, and uh, these scores are models that are usually smaller than the peers as well. So I think it's a pretty impressive result and uh, another pathway to potentially um, unlock scalability here. Yeah, so although you might not be able to apply this to, your, to our day-to-day -day models right now, something potentially is around the corner that's gonna leapfrog a lot just because it's it's a very different approach than transform models. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's like it's like the equivalent of like a combustion engine and then us figuring out, oh wow, there's electric vehicles as well. We've got two options now when it comes to scaling these systems. Yeah. Well thanks again, uh Sasha. I appreciate the the emails back and forth and we'll continue at this for a couple of episodes. Okay. Take care, man. My pleasure. Yeah. yeah.